Welcome to the deep dive. We sift through mountains of research to bring you the core insights, the stuff you really need to know. Glad to be here. Today, we're tackling a legend in audio history, the Nakamichi Stasis PA7 power amplifier. Oh yeah, a beast. And this is a deep dive into some pretty radical engineering for its time. It is. We're not just looking at a, you know, a big heavy box with lots of watts. No, not at all. We're exploring the philosophy behind it, how it aimed for stability and power right from the design's core. Exactly. Our mission really is to understand why that core tech, they called it stasis, why it kind of broke the rules of high fidelity design back then. And how that allowed it to achieve stability and power reserves that, frankly, a few others could touch. And the biggest clue is right there on the front panel, isn't it? That word, stasis. It is. That immediately tells you this wasn't just Nakamichi's own design soup to nuts. It used circuitry designed by the, uh, the legendary Nelson Pass. Right, the technology was licensed to Nakamichi by Threshold Corporation. Yeah, where Pass originally developed the whole stasis amplifier concept. Okay, so let's dig in. To understand stasis, we first need to understand the problem it was trying to solve. So maybe start with how a, let's say, a conventional high fidelity amp works. Good place to start. So for decades, the standard approach, the industry standard, has been using something called global negative feedback. Okay. It's basically the main way amps correct for distortion. You take a little sample of the output signal, you flip it upside down, invert it, and feed it back to the input. And that cancels out errors the components introduce? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. It cancels out a lot of the nonlinearity. It works. It's effective. But, well, it brings its own set of complexities. And is that complexity still a thing today, or was it more of an old-school design issue? Oh, it's absolutely still relevant. The main headache is keeping the amp stable under all sorts of real-world conditions especially when the speaker presents a difficult load. What makes a load difficult? Things like complex impedance curves or capacitance from the speaker cables. With negative feedback, you've got to carefully manage phase shift within the amplifier and how it interacts with that load to keep things stable. Right, and that's where the risk comes in for the person actually using the amp, the audio file. Precisely. The real danger is, say you use certain types of speaker cables, maybe long ones, high capacitance ones. Which people often do for high-end setups. Exactly. That capacitance can introduce phase shifts that basically confuse the feedback loop. And when that happens, the amp can become unstable. It can start to oscillate. Oscillate, meaning? Like produce a signal it's not supposed to. Yeah, often at a very high frequency, way above hearing. Mm -hmm. But that oscillation pumps huge amounts of energy into the speaker, especially the tweeter. It can literally fry expensive drivers. So the very thing designed to fix problems, the feedback, can actually cause catastrophic failure. Okay. That's the problem. That's the core problem Stasis addressed. So what is the Spaces solution then? How did it get around this? Well, the central idea, and it was pretty bold, was that the Nakamichi PA7 uses no overall or global negative feedback. None. Wow. Okay, so it's just inherently stable by design. That's the goal, yes. Hmm. Inherently stable from the ground up. But hang on, if you take away the main tool for correcting distortion, that sounds like a huge challenge. Doesn't that mean you'd need, I don't know, incredibly perfect, expensive components inside? What was the trade-off? Yeah, you nailed it. That's exactly the trade-off. The cost and complexity shifts, right? It moves away from needing complex control circuits for the feedback and towards needing exceptionally linear and precise components and circuit design in the first place. So more expensive to manufacture. Definitely. You need inherently better parts, better matching. But the result, well, it's what it says on the tin. An inherently stable, uniform impedance amplifier. Fire. Meaning its performance basically stays the same regardless of the speaker load or how demanding the music signal is. It avoids those feedback-related instabilities. That's the promise. Consistent, stable performance no matter what you connect it to or how hard you drive it. Within reason, of course. Okay, so the safety net of global feedback is gone. How did they manage to get massive, clean power out of this thing without that correction loop fixing small errors along the way? Yeah, that's where the cleverness of the PA7's parallel circuit topology really shows. It's like a two-part system working together. Okay, part one. Well, part one is the stasis section itself. This is a highly linear but low current stasis voltage amplifier. Its job is to define the perfect output voltage waveform, P. 
pure signal, no global feedback involved. Think of it as the uh, the very precise brain setting the pattern. Okay, precise brain. And part two must be the muscle then, the part that actually moves the speaker cones. Exactly. That's the high current side. It uses stages described as positive and negative current mirror bootstraps. Current mirror bootstraps. Okay, that sounds technical. Can we unpack that a bit? Yeah. Sure. Think of a current mirror basically as a circuit trick that lets you create a large stable current that directly follows or mirrors a smaller reference current. Okay. And the bootstrap part refers to how these high current stages work really closely alongside, in parallel with, that stasis voltage section. These bootstrap stages are the workhorses. They supply the huge currents the speaker actually needs to the muscle. So stasis sets the clean voltage pattern, the bootstraps deliver the big current, but where does the distortion correction happen then if there's no global feedback? This is the really elegant part. The stasis section isn't just setting the voltage pattern. It does produce a very small amount of current itself. Mm. And that small current acts like a tiny, super precise correction signal. It actively cancels out the small, unavoidable distortions that happen within those big current mirror bootstrap stages. Ah, so it corrects errors locally right where they happen in the power stage instead of waiting for the output and feeding it back. Yeah, exactly. It's a self-correcting parallel system happening in real time, not a loop going all the way back to the input. Much faster and avoids the phase shift issues. That parallel architecture needing both precision and brute force it must translate into some serious physical hardware. You mentioned it was a beast. Oh, it absolutely does. You need huge components to store and deliver that kind of current on demand. We're talking, what was it, 59 and a half pounds? Nearly 60 pounds. That's heavier than my carry-on luggage, easily. It needs a sturdy shelf. Definitely needs a sturdy <laughs> shelf. And it's physically imposing, too, over 17 inches wide, 16 and a half deep, nearly 8 inches tall, all black with those classic Nakamichi gold markings. Very purposeful looking. And I assume most of that weight is the power supply. A huge chunk of it, yes. The inside is just dominated by this massive 700-watt toroidal power transformer. And then there's the filter capacitance, a total of 132,000 microfarads. Wow, 132,000 microfarads. That's an enormous energy reservoir. It really is. It's there purely to handle sudden, massive current demands from the music without the voltage sagging instant power and the transistors to actually switch all that power 16 high power transistors per channel so 32 in total 14 per channel are in those big bootstrap current stages and two per channel are dedicated to the high precision stasis voltage section it feels over engineered in a good way felt like a tank what about connections all high quality gold plated rca input jacks naturally. And these really substantial multi-way heavy-duty binding posts for the speaker cables. They could easily take thick wire or dual banana plugs. Robust. Okay, let's get to the proof. The lab tests, the headroom. This is where we see what all that hardware and that unique stasis circuit actually do under pressure. The baseline specs are solid already, right? Yeah. 200 watts per channel into 8 ohms. Yep, 200 into 8 ohms and rated 330 watts into 4 ohms, both at less than 0.1% THD. Very respectable numbers on their own. But the stasis design, being stable into tough loads, suggests it should handle low impedance as well. What about the current output? That's where it gets really impressive. It's rated for 14 amps per channel continuous, which is already quite high. But the peak current capability was rated at a massive 50 amperes. 50 amps peak. Okay, so what happened when the lab guys pushed it, especially into lower impedances like 4 or even 2 ohms? This is where the design really showed its muscle. Yeah. Under static continuous testing until clipping. Meaning just driving it with a constant tone until it distorts. Right, it clipped at 253 watts into eight ohms, so well above spec. Into four ohms, it hit 400 watts. And into two ohms, driving just one channel, it managed a staggering 650 watts before clipping. 650 watts into two ohms, that's huge current delivery. That shows the power supply and output stage are not messing around. Not at all. But the dynamic power tests simulating musical peaks were even more dramatic. Right, that's arguably more important for how music actually sounds. Totally. Using that standard dynamic test signal, the PA7 reached 350 watts into 8 ohms. Okay, good job. Into 4 ohms, it hit 612 watts. 600 watts. And into 2 ohms. Nearly a kilowatt. 960 watts dynamically. Wow, okay, so the headroom figures must have been impressive then. They were. 
The dynamic headroom was calculated at 2.43 dBs into 8 ohms and 2.7 dBs into 4 ohms. Now, we hear dB figures like that sometimes, but what does, say, 2.43 dBs of dynamic headroom actually mean for the listener in practical terms? It means the amplifier could deliver nearly double, almost 1.75 times. Technically, it's rated continuous power for those brief, loud musical peaks. Think of a huge drum hit or cymbal crash or an explosion in a movie soundtrack. So it doesn't strain or compress the sound during those moments. Exactly. It has that massive reserve on tap instantly. That's why amps like this often sound so effortless and unstrained, even when playing complex dynamic music really loud. The peaks just happen. Okay, so colossal power, incredible stability, huge headroom. What about the other side of the coin? The finesse. Distortion, noise, the quality metrics. Also exceptional which really speaks to the inherent linearity of the stasis design, even without global feedback during the cleanup. The distortion was found to be almost independent of frequency. That's unusual, isn't it? Usually distortion creeps up at high frequencies. It often does, yeah. But here it stayed down around 0.03 to 0.04%, even at the full rated 200 watts into 8 ohms, right across the audio band. Very clean. And the noise floor? How quiet was it? Extremely quiet. The A-weighted noise measured Agus 100 dB relative to 1 watt output. Minus 100 dB relative to 1 watt. That sounds incredibly low. It is. If you translate that relative to its rated output of 200 watts, it's equivalent to Agus 123 dB. That's, well, it's essentially silence. Yeah. Far below anything you'd ever hear. Any noise is just buried deep, deep down. And just to confirm, the stability claim held up in testing, it didn't oscillate with reactive loads. Yep, the test confirmed it. It remained stable with various simulated complex speaker loads, including capacitive ones that might trip up a conventional feedback design. It did what it said on the tin. Those numbers are just phenomenal, really proving the concept. But, you know, owning something like this, it's not just about the specs on paper, is it? For a complex, expensive piece of gear, you worry about reliability, safety. That's a really important point. Yeah. Quality is more than just the circuit topology. And Nakamichi clearly thought about longevity and protection. What sort of protection did it have built in? Pretty robust stuff. The protection circuits operated independently for each channel, which is good design. They would instantly cut off the output if the amp was driven way too hard into clipping for too long. Also, if it detected any dangerous DC voltage at the output terminals, which could wreck speakers. Right. Or simply if the internal heat sinks got too hot, hitting 75 degrees Celsius thermal protection. So comprehensive safety features for the amp itself, and maybe more importantly, for the expensive speakers connected to it. Absolutely. Peace of mind is important with this kind of investment. What about other usability touches? Any little design details that stood out? They definitely paid attention to the user experience, even in small ways. Like the only control on the whole front panel is that big flat power switch plate. Yeah. Very minimalist. And because it draws so much power initially, they included an inrush current limiter circuit. So it doesn't trip your circuit breaker when you switch it on. Uh, oh. And when you do turn it on, the output stays muted for about five seconds. Why is that? It just gives all those complex internal circuits time to fully stabilize before any signal actually goes out to your speakers. Protects against nasty turn on thumps or pops. Smart. And you mentioned the weight earlier, that near 60 pounds did they make it easy to, well, move? They really did. The, the original reviews specifically praised the handles. They're these beautifully contoured handles, front and back, I believe, not just tacked on. They look integrated into the design. And they apparently make lifting and carrying this behemoth significantly safer and easier. Practical design, thinking about the user. And another nice touch, they put rubber feet on the back panel too. On the back. Why? So you could actually rest the amplifier on its back, maybe on the floor, while you're connecting all the input and speaker cables without scratching the amp or the floor. Just a small thing, but really consider it. It shows attention to detail beyond just the circuit diagram. So summing it all up, the verdict on the PA7 looking back. I think the consensus both then and now is that it was truly one of the elite amplifiers available. It got praise across the board for the innovative stasis design, mm -hmm. the bulletproof construction, the sound quality, the sheer power delivery. It really lived up to Nakamichi's reputation for quality at the time. So wrapping this deep dive up, what's the big takeaway here? What does the PA7 story really tell us? I think it's a fantastic example, a masterclass really, in how you can achieve incredible stability and massive power reserves by fundamentally questioning a long-held industry practice in this case, the reliance on global negative feedback.
It showed there was another way, a parallel self-correcting architecture that could deliver maybe even superior real-world performance, particularly with difficult loads, without the inherent risks of feedback loops. Precisely. And that actually leads to kind of a final provocative thought drawing from the source material itself. Yeah, go ahead. Well, the original Nakamichi brochure for the PA7 apparently made an interesting point. It acknowledged that the very definition of high fidelity is a high degree of faithfulness to the original signal. Okay, makes sense. But then it suggested that standard lab measurements, the kind we've just been discussing, often fail to show up the real audible differences between amplifiers of this elite class. Mm. So the specs don't tell the whole story. That's what they implied. So it leaves us and you listening with a question. If high fidelity means faithfulness, and if the standard tests maybe don't capture all the subtle sonic nuances, What's ultimately the most important measure of an amplifier like this? Is it the final numbers on the test bench? Or is it the inherent stability, the build quality, the engineering philosophy that questions assumptions the things built into its very design? That's a great question to ponder. Specs versus design philosophy. Something to think about next time you're looking at high-end audio gear. Indeed. Food for thought.